Should you trust your retirement plan? And the answer is yes, but verify. Trust, but verify. We're going to look at this book or this article by my man Jim Oder right here, O-T-A-R. He had written in 2007. I've, I've read this oh, many, many times because I very much love it. And the article is Monte Carlo Simulators. Are they worth a gamble? All right. So we're going to look into this a little bit because I think this is critical to understand how retirement plans work. So the idea is, is your retirement plan safe? And we're going to say it could be, but you better be on it like stink on Finney's dog poop as opposed to just set it and forget it. All right. Uh, Jim had just uh, wrote a book or just published a book on Amazon called Advanced Retirement Income Planning, which I'm very much looking forward to reading here. I've been a big fan of this guy for a long, long time. He's retired now, by the way. I, I, I've emailed him a couple of times to be interviewed, and uh, he has never got back to me, so that's fine. And I, I'm not offended. I just, you know, I, I think it'd be cool to ask him some questions. All right. Uh, Monte Carlo adds random fluctuations to a steady growth rate of the portfolio. All right, so oh, i got to get my pen here. The user selects a baseline, assume base of return, and a deviation from that baseline. The model then runs thousands or millions of scenarios uh, by randomly varying this deviation. All right. The, one of the problems with Monte Carlo is how it generates randomness. The randomness is generating using a distribution curve. There are many types of distribution curves, but the main one, the normal curve, a Gaussian or yeah, I think it's Gaussian. Is it Ga Gaussian? I think it's Gaussian. I don't know. I'm not French. I'm sure it's was French. You know, Benoit, Mandelbrot, Benoit. Uh, he had talked about Gaussian bell curves, normal bell curves a lot. And we have, you know, not, we, we, uh, we want to challenge these in some regard. All right. So anyway, so we're just going to assume an 8% growth rate and we're going to assume a 10% standard deviation just for simplicity here. All right. So basically what we're saying is we have a, a normal distribution and what the normal distribution means is if the baseline is eight percent and the standard deviation would we'll just say 10 well in this case he says standard deviation is between plus and minus 16 percent then a 10 percent growth rate with projection is forecast more often than a three percent growth rate projection all right and the reason for that is because a 10 percent is closer to the three uh, to the eight because it's closer it's going to have a lot more numbers the three in terms of how much is going to show up more would you get more of 10 or would you get more of three well three is, is further away from the median or in this case it's the uh, the assumed rate of return so what happens with this projection too is that you're going to get more closer to here and less as you go further out so the further out you're going to get less frequency if that makes sense and that's just your basic monte carlo uh, bell curve which I, i'm very comfortable with all right let's keep going here the second constraint of Monte Carlo is that it offers random outcomes and ignores the effects of cyclical events. And this is a big one right here. Uh, Monte Carlo simulations based on statistical randomness around a preferred, a predefined straight line, 8% here. Increasing the, defined, uh, increasing the the envelope of these outcomes does not make it more accurate. If the model does not fit well, then running 10 million simulations doesn't help at all composed of running 10. Most Monte Carlo simulators ignore the extreme, these fat tails. All right, so what this means is when you're running a Monte Carlo, you got three standard deviations we're using. All right, three standard deviations. And that simply means 99.8% of the time, with our 8% growth rate of return and our 10% standard deviation, we would expect our rate of return with a 99.8% of the time probability to be, so what we do is we take that 8 times 30 because we take three standard deviations that's 38 uh, 8 uh, plus 30 38 so we would expect our portfolio to be uh let's see what do we got to do here now i can't remember we got to be 38 on the plus uh 22 on the down so we would expect our portfolio in any given year to be no more up than 38 percent or no more down than 22 percent with these numbers the problem with these numbers, though, is we're just generating them. We are just self-selecting them. And I did a video on this a couple, maybe a year ago or two years ago, what the, your rate of return projections would have been like in 1996 or something like that, and what your standard deviation would have been in 1996. I, I can't remember exactly what it was. Right before the great, uh, the reawakening of the aughts, the last decade of the aughts. So we'd had high rates of return and lower standard deviations. 
Uh, and then that did not project very well going into the next 10 to 20 years. It just did not. And then if you look at 19 or 2009, we're going to have lower returns and higher standard deviations. And that did not project as well going into 2000, the, the teens, if that makes sense. So this is the, the point is, if my numbers or assumptions are correct, 8% and the 10% standard deviation, then this is true. 99.8% of the time, within three standard deviations, we should get no more than a 38% rate of return and no less than a 22%. But what if these numbers are off? What if these numbers are off? And that's the problem. Now, again, I did a video on this a couple of years ago talking about that. Part two of this, too, what's, what the drawback about Monte Carlo is it does it assumes everything is completely random. And we know investments aren't random. You look at 1973 and 1974, the markets were down consecutively. In 2000, 2001, and two, even into Q3, Q1 of 2003. The markets were down consecutively. You look at uh, October 1st, 2007 to March 9th of 2009, the markets were down. They weren't random. They were, they had some, then you look at bull markets too. You know what I'm saying? What generally is, that's why trends and momentum make sense. Monte Carlo doesn't do that. Monte Carlo says, hey, we're just going to roll these dice. Everything is completely random from each other. I don't like, but Jim actually says in this, which I thought was kind of, I didn't agree with this at all. He goes, uh, uh, when we look at history, we observe that markets are random in the short term, cyclical in the midterm, and trending up, down, or sideways in the long term. I, I don't agree with that at all. I think they're actually more, I think, in terms of, I think the short term is where they feed off each other. That's why we have, you know, again, 1973, 1974, 2000, 2001, 2, 2007, 8, 9. That's why we have the, the big events that kind of, they precede each other, one after another after another, and then something happens, and Jim even acknowledges that right there. If something happens later on down the road where it just it snaps and everyone says, okay, now it's time to go the other direction. There's huge trends. The point being here is that, all right, he says one other thing here. Uh, the results from such a simulation will be flawed because in reality, once Marcus, dis this is actually important. This is where the long term right here, um, in terms of, I think the trend of the long term is, is up that way we, until it's not, until it's not. But anyway, Japan. But anyway, right here, once markets decide to stay bullish, they stay under the bullish distribution curve for as long as 20 years. Then some invisible hand or seemingly unimportant event pushes the trend either to the left fat tail, we're going to stay for a number of years at yeah, 100%. So he's basically what he's saying is like, look, the markets are not random. They do follow each other. That's a problem with Monte Carlos. That's a problem with Monte Carlos. And so what's going to happen sometimes, my friends, is you're going to look at your retirement plan. You're going to have an 88% probability of success in year one, right? And then the next year, the markets drop 15%, which has already been in baked in in this 88% probability. We've already baked this in, you know, assuming, and I use really conservative numbers, by the way, high standard deviations, volatility, low average rates, expected rates of return. So now you're down to 78%. And now you're flipping out because you're like, what? I, you know, because 85 is a magic number. 85 is a sweet spot. And the reason you're down to 78% is because this was only 15%. All right. I mean, you lost 15%. Now, don't forget, in theory, the Monte Carlo would have had this going down another 15% potentially. In theory. I mean, that's what, you know, it gets random because it was random. We're running a thousand iterations. So there's nothing to say it can't be down two straight 15% years. But now it's down to 63%. Now, is that truly baked into that initial 85%? Is it? And that's the problem. That is, that's a problem. There's no other way around that. Now, what's the likelihood of it happening at two straight negative 15%? Well, I mean, it has. In 73, 74, 2000 was down 9, 2001 was down 11, 2012, 2002 was down 22%. But very rarely does that happen. Very rarely does it happen. So now we're at 63% in year three. And so you're asking, was that already baked into it? And in fact, we just don't know because they're random. That's a random sequence of events. We don't know. We don't know. So what would Monte Carlo say? Well, if we, this is down again. On, the, on top of that, what happens if we go to 88? We go to 95%. Well, again, now we're up 30%. So we're at 95%. And again, what happens if you look historically, we're going to have another positive year in the next couple of years. Back to back. Does Monte Carlo show that? They show random. The point being is there's no, we're, we're trying to predict the future and we can't. So we got to start first and foremost with low expected rates of return and high standard deviations. If you want to be cautious, you start with low rates of return, high standard deviations. So for me, with all stocks, a 6% rate of return with a 17% standard deviation. Uh, standard deviation. That's what we use for my, uh, when I'm running Monte Carlo scenarios in my uh, right capital values. 
And so we take that, we take this times three times 17, that's 51. So plus or minus six means on any given year, we could be up 57% or down, what's that, 45. Now we've never had a year that we're down 45% ever. And when you factor in inflation, I use numbers that are even worse than the Great Depression. In fact, 2008 was the worst year we ever had when you factor in inflation. So we're starting with a low expected rates of return, high standard deviations. And that will give us a very volatile Monte Carlo scenario. And if we can withstand that, we're probably pretty good. But we don't know for sure. You don't know. And I will tell you, if your thing goes from 88 to 78 to 63 and you're at 63, you're freaking you know, starting to sweat bullets, man. Because you could theoretically say I could have another negative 15%. Did Monte Carlo show three straight negative 15%? I don't think so. I don't think so because it's all random. The point being is this is why you got to validate this stuff every year, man. You have to. You got to say, okay. Because remember, we're also, we don't need 30. Here we're in 30-year retirement plan, 29 years, 28 years. You see what I'm saying? We're, we're less years behind us or in front of us because we've lived two or three, four, five more years. You just can't rely on the initial numbers. You've got to come back every couple of years. But I tell you, the best way to do this, I was just talking to these people today. The best way to do this, man, is to make sure you got to understand your expenses. These guys today at Oregon just crushing. Um, and we're just like, you know, he's trying to decide if he wants to take a full benefit on his pension for his spouse or buy life insurance. We're kind of going over that. I said, either way, as long as we have that money, she's going to be fine. Is, you know, surviving him by a number of years. She's going to be fine as long as that money is there. You know what I'm saying? I.e., if you don't take a survivor benefit and you said do life insurance, the life insurance goes kaput before you do, she's in a world of hurt. And the reason is because with his pension and their two the social security, it's not huge. That's all they need. So Monte Carl doesn't matter because even if they ran out of money, even if this went to zero, they still got between their social security and the pension, like, I don't know, like 90,000 a year or something, I can't remember, like 90,000 a year. And at some point they have no debt. I'm like, okay, so worst case scenario is you, got, you ran out of money because that's what Monte Carlo says. Will you have money left over when the surviving spouse dies? Live, liquid assets, not house, not your car, not your baseball car collection, all that stuff. Will you have liquid assets? Even if you don't have any liquid assets, do you have income? And the answer is, of course they do. They got Social Security, too, and a pension. They're, they're, I mean, are they going to be living like light cigars with $100 bills? No. But on top of that, they're going to be in their 80s, late 80s. Are they really going to need that kind of scratch? No. But the Monte Carlo might show zero. That's what makes it, everyone wants to focus on the percentage. I'm like, look, I trust but verify. And again, what that means is how do you verify this? Well, you verify by looking at your expenses. Get a better gauge of expenses. So these guys, we, they never retired before. They never retired before. And they just don't know. And the reason they don't know their expenses is because they haven't had to know their expenses because when you're working, you're spending to the extent of your income. You don't even know half the time where that money goes. When you retire, it's a whole different ball game. I'm telling you, man, when you start pulling money from your portfolio, you're going to start saying, can I afford X, Y, Z? You know, when you're working, you're like, yeah, I can afford it. I got the income. Anyway, hope this helps a little bit. And again, this isn't to say doubt your retirement plan. It's to freaking validate that. A, knowing your expenses, knowing your income, and then C, A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. Oops, I forgot what it is. K, L, M, something like that. Anyway, we got to know A, what your expenses are, expenditures are. B, what your income is. C, if we go to zero, will that, rot, will that kill us? No, it won't necessarily, but it could. I don't know. And then finally, D is what we got to figure out. Oh, I forgot what D was. I want to say anything what D was. If it changes, if it goes from 88 to 70, what, what is causing that? What can we do to, to re rectify that? We can't just sit idly by necessarily. That would be maybe the year we don't take that vacation to Sweden. You know, maybe we don't donate 2,500 bucks to Sniffy Joe's re-election campaign. You know what I'm saying? That would be the year to say, you know, I'm going to hang tight. Anyway, love your thoughts on this. Again, I'll put a link in the show notes for this. But I haven't read it yet, so you, you can't hold me accountable to it. But uh, again, that's that book right there. I'll put a link in the show notes. God bless. We'd love to, we'd love to hear your thoughts. See you.